unchain my heart. Soul emerged from a forgotten America, where blacks were an oppressed minority, and their music confirmed the worst fears of a conservative white society. It is obviously a means by which the white man and his children can be driven to the level with the niggers. Unchain my heart. It was a music born of an oppressed people that said to you, a better day is coming. There was a price paid for this music. Against all the odds, it was a blind pianist named Ray Charles who would first bring soul music to the world. He was the genius. He turned the world on to that soul music is, is here. It's not coming, it's here. Ray Charles was the first to unify two opposing forces, the sexually charged rhythms of the dance hall and the emotionally charged rhythms of the black church. The music he created would lead to a revolution in sound, the birth of soul. The story of soul music begins in America in the 1930s. The country was racially segregated and deeply divided, and blacks lived as second-class citizens. The North and South were almost separate nations, and more than a thousand miles away from the sophisticated sounds of Harlem, the South had changed very little since the abolition of slavery. It was here in Albany, Georgia, that Ray Charles Robinson was born on September 23rd, 1930. At just five years old, he began to lose his sight. By the age of seven, Ray Charles was completely blind. As a blind child from a poor background, he was sent to Florida's school for the deaf and blind, St. Augustine's. Blind black children had limited opportunities, but Ray Charles was bright and determined to make something of himself. Ray Charles could type 75 words a minute when he was nine years old on a regular typewriter. But there was a more enjoyable distraction for Ray Charles at school, an old beaten up piano. It was so impressive to me, especially just to mash a key and hear a sound. Like, wow, are you, you know, it stopped me from playing out in the yard. I don't care what I was doing. When I heard that, that was it for me. With characteristic single-mindedness, Ray set about teaching himself to play. He learned to read music by braille, which when you think of it, is very difficult to learn a piano part. He would read the braille part for the right hand with his left hand and play it. Then he would learn the left hand by reading the braille with his right hand and play it, and then put them together. But that way he learned the Moonlight Sonata and pieces by Bach and Chopin. Ray's blindness led him to a world dominated by sound, and he was drawn to the radio, which represented an escape from the mundane routine of life in the school. Ray and his friend Joe Walker imagined life on the air. Well, my whole thing was I told Ray, I said, Ray, I'm going to be a radio announcer, and I'm going to play your music. I'm going to be the one to introduce you. CBS Radio presents the music of Ray Charles, his piano and his orchestra. Direct from Frank Daly's Meadowbrook, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ray Charles. He said, you really gonna do it, man? I said, you're right. Hey, everybody! It would be more than 20 years before the childhood dreams of Ray Charles could become a reality. Before that could happen, 
Ray Charles would need to master a whole range of musical skills. One man, more than any other, inspired the young Ray. His name was Louis Jordan. Don't sit there mumbling, talking trash. If you want to have a ball, you gotta go out and spend some cash and let the good times roll. Louis Jordan was a charismatic young sax player from Arkansas, whose band, the Timpani Five, took over the black radio of the 1940s. He would be one of Ray Charles's greatest influences. Let the good times roll, I like that. I was a real fan of Louis Jordan, that's all I can tell you. But I love to see her smile, cause she's my honey child. Everything blended, everything matched. I can really understand what people mean when they talk about a painting, how all the colors just, just all just sort of come together like they're supposed to, you know. But the same thing is in, true in sound, too. And I was crazy about his music. More than just a virtuoso musician, Louis Jordan was an out-and-out -out entertainer. But Louis, honey, I don't ever want to look at anyone but you. Joe, don't you? What makes your big head so hard? Louis Jordan could do everything. He could play, he wrote the music, he danced, he made movies, he did the score. He did everything. He had a lot of songs for Cal on it. It would start off with a bass playing, doom, 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 doom. and he'd go down about four times, and the horns come in, da 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 in 1945, Louis Jordan released Caldonia. It would be one of his biggest hits and led the way for an entire generation of musicians. This was a brand new kind of music. Walking with my baby, she got great big feet. She's long, lean, and lanky, and ain't had nothing to eat. But she's my baby, and I love her just the same. Crazy about that woman, cause Caldonia is her name. Caldonia! Caldonia! What make your big head so hard? Mouth! Some of the, the real good stuff that Louis Jordan did was that when it was just, he had himself playing alto and uh, a guy playing trumpet in a rhythm section. And man, I mean, they were, they were just unique. This wasn't jazz, and it wasn't blues. It was a powerful combination and something entirely fresh. It would later become known as rhythm and blues. The rhythm section and the, the beat and the pulse that they create is the, is the most important thing that changed it all around. Well, it's a sweet gal he's singing about. Louis does up the package in a bright red bow. Especially when it's all for the love of live. He had kind of what you would call before him a jump band. The jump meant that you kind of like. It swang like crazy. With people who like to dance, Lyrics do not inspire them to dance. It's the rhythm inspires them to dance. And all those songs had ants in their pants, and you need to dance. His music says, hey, everybody, let's have fun. What's happening? Come on, dance with me, talk to me. I'm going to seduce you. I'm going to flirt with you. I'm going to fool around with you. I'm going to shake my butt at you. See, the most important thing is to be able to get where you want to be and stay there and intensify the heat. See, in music, losing the groove is like a guy having sex with a woman and he keeps, his Johnson keeps falling out. You know, when a band gets to their thing, see, if they, if they slip out, it's actually that bad. You know, yeah, you can, they can go back in, but it's not the same thing. Louis Jordan left the mournful sound of the blues for dead. This was feel-good music, dance tunes for black America. And that black man, a black woman, can come and work all the week and get paid off 12 o'clock on Saturday and have more fun in one day than the boss did 
in, the, in, in, in a year. Growing up in the 1940s, Ray Charles was exposed to a wide range of musical influences, from Louis Jordan to Nat King Cole. And by the age of 15, he was able to play piano in the style of all the big stars of the day. Oh, he was a great pianist when he left. Ray could play any song anybody else wanted to play. He had started to develop a taste for all kinds of music. Anything Ray Charles set his mind to do, he would do it. Hell, if anybody could come back alive, it's Ray Charles. In 1945, Ray Charles left the security of the deaf and blind school behind and decided to try and make a living as a professional musician. Went to see my sweetheart last night around about 10. She said, home. Hitting the road, by the age of 16, he was already a working pianist on the black dance circuit. He would have been learning how to work the crowd, how to set tempos, how to build a climax, how to get them screaming, then how to calm them down after you got them screaming. All showbiz, not tricks exactly, but the, the tools of the trade of uh, being a, a performing musician. And uh, wh where's the piano? Oh. That's a good piano. Okay. One, two, one, two, three, hey! Out on the road, Ray worked with a number of more established acts and landed a job playing piano for rising star Ruth Brown. It was so funny because when I got there at rehearsal that day, I said to my road manager, I said, how's he going to play my music and he's blind, you know? And that was the stupidest thing I ever said in my life because he taught me how to feel my music. He taught me how to feel what I didn't see. I'm on a ride, on a ride. I just can't ride. No Artists like Ruth Brown and Ray Charles traveled the length and breadth of the country, supplying the demands of a rapidly growing black audience. The 1940s was a vibrant period in black music. Ever since Louis Jordan had burst onto the scene, Black America had developed a taste of upbeat urban rhythms. But on every level, American life was racially segregated and the record industry was no different. Until 1947, black music was known as race music. Jerry Wexler, a reporter at Billboard magazine, was asked to find a more politically acceptable term. There was some feeling that this was beginning to be resented, this race record business. And it was decided by the music staff to change the uh, category race music. And uh, we used to put the book to bed on a Friday night and come back to work on a Tuesday. And so Paul Ackerman, the editor, said, when you all come in on Tuesday, let's have some ideas of what we should change this to. So everybody chipped in with a notion. And uh, I said, what about rhythm and blues? They said, oh, we like it. So it was no big deal at the time. This new branding gave urban black music a new identity, and Rhythm and Blues was born. A pair of music-loving entrepreneurs, Ahmet and Nessui Ertigan, spotted the gap in the market and decided to form a record company that would come to define the new sound of Rhythm and Blues. They called it Atlantic Records. Atlantic Records is a, is a very fascinating phenomenon because Atlantic Records is about two Turkish guys who were about as far removed from blues as you could be. You know, the Erdogan brothers, who were, you know, the sons of diplomats and all that. And I mean, you know, uh, uh, Ahmed Erdogan today is one of the sharpest men in New York City, bar none. We had a, a good feel for where the music was going. Our target audience in the beginning was the black audience, which understands the music that they like and their tastes change, and once they change, they don't go back. Atlantic's future was secured when in 1948 they signed the woman that Ray Charles supported on the road, Ruth Brown. Because I'm gonna call a little lady out here who they call Little Miss Rhythm, and find out why they call her Little Miss Rhythm. Hey, Ruthie Brown. Hi, Willie. Hi, Willie. How you 
feel? Just wonderful. I want to ask you a question. Why, sure. Uh, all over the country, you hear people saying, uh, Ruthie Brown, little Miss Rhythm. Why do they call you Miss Rhythm? That's right. Well, I really don't know. Huh? What, I've that? never really thought about it. Well, think about it now. No, but I guess it's just because, uh, maybe I always feel that rhythm. You got that feeling now? <laughs> right this minute. The power of Ruth Brown's style was that it negotiated both rhythm and blues and blues and jazz. 